pick out songs I love. You got to give. <laughs> sure enough, I was playing on YouTube. Uh, my life is in you coming over yesterday. Hey, Eddie, Sue, and I just need a little pelt. And I love, I love that music. It kind of bounces. And so I played that one. All right. Uh, been a, uh, kind of a different week for me. And uh, I would like to ask you to pray for the Bennett family. Dwayne's Celebration Life Service is Friday. And I, Ms. Edith and Tom Bennett have been out here before, a long time ago, but she's asked me a couple times this week about the church, and uh, she's having a real hard time. She's 86 years old, and of course, Dwayne was her primary caregiver and uh, in charge of the estate, so we pray for Ms. Edith. She's having a hard time. But I want to tell you I love you. I know it's just been four days, and... Um, uh, but I know some of you have been here every service. And I've never done this before. I'm not going to preach tonight. I'm going to have a, a what I call a fireside chat. This is the kind of little talks I do with my grandkids when we're in the mountains. <laughs> and, and what I'm trying to do is I try to plant things in them um, that they, they may not they, it may not look like they're listening, you know how kids are, but they're getting more than we think, and and they may not think about these things after Granddaddy's gone, but one of these days, I hope all these things will come back to them. But I want to share, because of my age, I'm 73, be 74 in August, and because of the way things are, I doubt I'm ever going to get this opportunity again, and so I want to tell you some things, kind of like Paul talking to Timothy in that last letter. These are just some things I want to share with you that come from my experience of uh, 61 years as a Christian and 54 as a pastor and uh, things that I wish I had understood early on. I'm not saying that nobody told me about these things. Unfortunately, I was uh, on up in life before... Uh, number one ever became a reality in my life. So I'm going to read one verse of Scripture out of uh, Galatians 6.14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Let's say a prayer. Father, you know my heart tonight. I love these people. Um, I don't want to bore them. Uh, Lord, I, I, and, and I want to encourage them. And, and if you could use me, I would even say inspire them. But I pray tonight you will help me as I share my heart with them. And you know that what I share is in love and it's for their welfare and their benefit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, there are three things that I, I highly recommend that every one of you do. Number one, establish and maintain a daily quiet time. Now, I came out of seminary in 1974, and I had all these lofty ideals, you know, and one of them was I was going to get up at 4.30 and be in the office at 5 and pray for four hours. That's, that's real bad advice. Don't do that. Don't try to start big. And, of course, after one hour, sometimes I didn't last an hour, you know, and I'm falling on my desk, and uh, I struggled, folks. I struggled. When I got to Danville, I did the same thing. Started over again. <laughs> I'm going to be there at 5 o'clock, you know. And, and But I, I, I didn't have a quality quiet time. Now, I maintained the discipline, but I got to tell you, folks, it was not quality quiet time. So I, I want to tell you how to start a quiet time. Now, many of you already have one. You already have one. And you know that you got to make it a priority. you got to do it in the first part of the day. But here's the key. Uh, it's like in that movie, uh, The Patriot. Aim small, miss small. Start small. Start small. If you only set aside five or ten minutes, if you're still in the workforce and you got to be at work 630, 
You can't do th two or three hours. Don't worry about that. Don't even worry about time. Uh, four or five minutes. Do a, our daily bread or some little devotion. But have you a time, just you and the Lord. Nobody, it's got to be a place. Got to be a place where it's just you and the Lord. Because it's, you've got to maintain that intimacy and there can't be anyone else around. No matter how much you trust them, how much you love them, it's got to be just you and the Lord. When a, when a husband wants to be intimate with his wife, he don't want, to, he don't want anybody around, does he? And when you want to be intimate with the Lord, you find you a place where you can talk out loud, you can sing out loud, you can do whatever you want, and you don't have to worry about anybody listening. Listen, nothing you say is going to surprise the Lord. Nothing you confess is going to catch him off guard. Nothing you confess is really going to hurt him. But we make confessions to him that might hurt others. So that's why we need to be alone with him. Now, to make it interesting, what you do is you combine, combine your Bible reading with your prayer. Now, if you haven't discovered this, get in the Psalms. That's David's prayer book. I mean, it'll be a tremendous help. And, and the first part of our prayer is praise and adoration. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And Joe David does real well here. He used to have an education director who started off all his prayers with praise and adoration. That's a weakness for me. But David is a tremendous help to me. So read the Psalms and then put them in your own uh, language, paraphrase them, and just pray them back to the Lord. And uh, to help me, I've got a notebook. <laughs> I've got stacks of notebooks because I've been doing it for 50 years. But I got a, a wire-bound notebook, and I write my prayers. And I, don't, I, I, I pray aloud. I pray aloud. I pray silent. I pray when, I'm, pray when I'm driving places. Pray aloud then. People pull up beside me, and I'm talking to the Lord, and they probably think I'm crazy. Hey, but I write prayers down. Number one, I can go back later and read them. I can see how God answered prayer. But when you're praying Scripture back to God, it's easier to do if you write it out. So you mix your Bible study with your prayer. And the Bible's full of prayers. In every letter Paul writes, you look, there's a prayer. Uh, Nehemiah 9, prayer. Ezra 9, prayer. Daniel 9. These are long prayers. Use the Word of God to help you pray. And um, you're going to discover something. It, now listen, Bible reading is not going to become a passion overnight. Now, here's what I'm ashamed to confess, but I'm going to be honest with you. I struggled with that all my life. I, I used to read the Bible to preach. I'd read the Bible to get my points for preaching or teaching, and I didn't read it to nourish my, my spirit like, you know, you eat a meal to nourish your body and take the nutrients and the vitamins in. we got to feed on God's Word. And see, I wasn't doing that. That's why I was so anemic. So let me tell you what got me started. I tried to read the Bible through, I don't know how many times. So I've read Genesis a bunch of times. Because <laughs> I'd try to read it through. I'd get in Leviticus somewhere and get bogged down. Or Songs of Solomon. And uh, I just wouldn't make it through. Finally, I was over 50. I'm ashamed to tell you that. But I was over 50 years old. Um. Uh, American Bible Society put out a little Bible, a paperback, cost a dollar, contemporary English version, and it had a chart in it. And you read three chapters a day and you check it off and you read the Bible in a year. And so I got that and I, I did it. Me and Thomas Roy and seven or eight people in the church did it. Well, he got through by April and I finished by June or July. When, you, when I got into the life of David, I couldn't stop reading. I mean, it's, 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 it gets really interesting. And I discovered things that I, I, I'd been missing. But here's what, I, here's what I want to say. Over time, when you make it a habit and you read every day, it'll become a passion. My favorite time of the day is in the morning. 
my quiet time when I'm in a little building. I go to bed at night looking forward to getting up in the morning and getting in the Word and having my quiet time. Now, folks, like I said, that didn't happen quickly for me. I read the Bible through in that, that less than a year. I said I'd do it again with another version. Then an evangelist came to town and he told me I've read every English version in print. And I don't know if he, he knows how many is in print or not. There's over 100. And I'm up around 35 or 36 or 7, something like that. But folks, if you keep reading the Bible, it will become a passion. And you got to put that with your prayer. Number two. So number one, if you don't have a quiet time, start one. And start small. You say, well, I'm going to pray to 12 o'clock tomorrow. I'm going to get up. <laughs> You're setting yourself up for failure. If you have to start with five minutes, start with five minutes. Number two, learn to share your faith. Many people, many Christians, live their entire life and they never share their faith. Now, I know this happened 41 years ago because my daughter will be 49 in a few weeks. And this man came to Danville. He was a Gideon. And he had an unusual testimony. And one of my men heard him at one of these Gideon uh, banquets. And he said, Brother Jack, you've got to get this guy. His name was Tyler Short, but he wasn't short. <laughs> He was 6'8", weighed about 300. He worked at a steel mill in Bessemer in the daytime, and he was a bouncer at a bar at night. Now listen, if he told me to get out of an establishment, he'd only have to do it once. I don't think he had much trouble as a bouncer. He was huge. Well, he, he, he weighed 13 pounds when he was born. His mama didn't survive. He was raised from pillar to post. And, but the influence around him, what little he went to church was Church of God. Well, he got a hold of the Gideon Bible, and he read it. He got saved. And so he went to the Church of God. That's all he knew. And he went every time the doors were open. He did that for about six months. And then he went to the pastor, and he said, Pastor, this is not what I thought it was going to be. He said, I thought the Christian life was going to be fun and exciting and exhilarating he said, I don't mean to put you down, but he said, just coming to church. He said, it's okay. But he said, I thought there was more. And the pastor said, there is more. And he took him aside. And he took a little track. And he said, I want you to study this track, memorize this gospel track. He said, I want you to go home and you just treat your bathroom mirror like it's a person. And he said, I want you to present the gospel to that bathroom mirror for a week and then you come back and talk to me so he did and he said now I want you to find a person and I want you to present it to them well Tyler he worked at the steel mill he pulled into that big parking lot and he saw no boy getting out of his car so he goes over and grabs him <laughs> he said let me tell you what happened to me <laughs> and of course that boy's all ears you know <laughs> And, of course, it scared that kid to death, and uh, he was in shock, and he didn't get saved right then. But before the year was over, Tyler already led five or six people there at work to Jesus. And uh, he, 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 he discovered something that many Christians don't know. Your joy comes from your obedience and doing what the Lord told us to do. And now we don't have to catch the fish, but we got to try. <laughs> we got to learn that there's joy in fishing, whether we reel it in or not. We, we just, we got to present the gospel. And people like me are lazy in doing that. Of, of the three things I'm going to share, this is the one where I struggle the most. And it's a lot of it's laziness. Present the gospel. And one night back when we did faith, uh, this little girl, they didn't stay with us long. Uh, she and her husband were veterinarians. I think that's right. But they were in our area just for about a year. They moved from there to Moscow, Tennessee. Her name was Nancy. 
really petite. I'd guess five, six or so, weighed about 100 pounds soaking wet. And they went to present, and Jerry Seegers was her team leader, and Jerry would, he would push you out there. If it's your night to present, he'd just do the introduction. He'd say, now Nancy's going to share the golf. Well, they got in a trailer, and the man was there, and all they knew was just the man, and he was nice. He was nice. And in faith, you had two women and a man, or vice versa, but the woman always knocked on the door because, you know, and so uh, he let Nancy in, and she was presenting. She done got that far. And all of a sudden, a mad wife come out of a bedroom, and she ran him out of the trailer screaming at him, get out of my house. Well, when Nancy got back and we had report time and she shared that, uh, I thought, she'll never go again. That, that's probably knocked the spiritual wind out of her. But I watched that night in report time. Something happened that never happened before. When she shared her testimony that night, we wound up just having a one, never happened again. Had a wonderful, joyful praise service right there. Everybody was elated. And it's like Peter and John when they got beat by the Sanhedrin. And they walked out. And they, they was all happy. They'd just been beat. But their, our joy comes from our obedience. And then the third thing is get involved in ministry and missions. Now, we got a lot of unhappy Baptists. And I can tell you one reason they're unhappy. It's not just because they're not right with God. It's because they're not involved in ministry and missions. They're spectators. They're spectators. They, they watch and they critique, but they're not involved themselves. Now, the last story I'm going to tell is a George W. Truett story. Uh, about when I first retired, I went to Lebanon to preach, and a layman got up to introduce me. He said, Brother Jack is the only preacher that I've ever heard preach that I can remember his sermon. And so, man, I, it was killing me. And after the service, he said, his name is Dob, brother. I said, Brother Dob, what was the sermon? He said, I don't remember the sermon, but I remember the story. <laughs> and this, this is one of my favorite stories. And I think it doesn't need much explanation. George W. Truett ministered First Pastor, First Baptist Dallas, in the early 1950s, before welfare. You, you can't think like today. They did have automobiles, not with air conditioners, but they had automobiles. And, of course, he had affluent, wealthy people in his church. And one of his newest converts was a very wealthy, single man. And uh, he joined the church. But about six months later, kind of like Tyler, he came back to Dr. Truett and came in his office. And he said, Dr. Truett, I, I want you to take my name off the church roll. Dr. Truett said, I've never had anybody make that request. And, and he said, I'm j I, it's just not what I thought it was. I don't have any joy. And he said, I feel like a hypocrite, and I don't want to be a hypocrite. And I'd just like for you to remove my name from the church row. Well, Dr. Truitt, uh, you know, he was taken back, but he was very quick-witted. I wish I was. And, and he had a note that his secretary put on his desk that morning. And it was a woman's address. And she had like five or six children. This is before welfare, folks. This is back when if somebody didn't help you, you starved. We don't allow people to starve anymore, but... This was back a long time ago. He said, okay, I, I'll remove your name from the roll. But he said, would you do me one favor first? He reluctantly said, I don't know, Dr. Truett. He said, just, just do me one favor, and then if you still want me to remove your name, I will. He said, okay. So he handed him that address. He said, this woman's got several children. And they don't have anything to eat in the house. And I would like for you to go to the grocery store, get several bags of groceries, and carry it to this address. So he did. He had plenty of money. That wasn't a problem. He bought several bags of groceries, put them in his car. 
But he was really nervous. <laughs> he had never done anything like this before. He found the address. So he's trying to get those bags on the porch where he can knock on the door and run jump in his car. <laughs> but those kids hear him. And they come out. They come through that door. And they, they swarm him. They're around him like bees. And um, they're touching him. And... And then the mother comes, and she said, and they're getting the groceries. She said, you got to come in. No, no ma'am, I'm, I'm, I'm. She said, no, you got to come in. You got to come in. So they, he goes in, and she's, she says, the kids and I were praying before you came. And we were telling the Lord that we didn't have anything to eat. And we were asking him to provide. And he said, you drove up. And he said, it's like you're an angel. <laughs> and he said, the Lord has used you. And um, she, they formed a circle. And she said, we want you to lead us in prayer before you go. <laughs> he said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I've never prayed out loud in public ever before in my life. And she said, oh, you can do it. <laughs> and all the kids, they done, they done made the circle. They're looking up, you know. And so he bows his head and he, he, he prayed just a simple prayer. And then all them kids had to hug him. <laughs> and the woman thanked him repeatedly. They, they, they escorted him to his car. Oh, it's a big deal, you know. They, they were just thrilled. And when he walked in Dr. Truitt's office, this is what he said. He said, give me another name. Give me another name. The reason we got so many cantankerous, unhappy Baptists is they don't know the joy of ministry. They need another name. They need somebody to help. And I've, I've been with people that I love when tragedy struck, like things like what's happened to the Bennett family this week. I've known wives to lose their husbands. And I've known them to give in to the self-pity. And I'd tell them, you know what you need? You need to get out of this house and go help somebody. Because there's somebody out there in worse shape than you're in. And the best therapy in the world <laughs> is to get involved in helping other people in ministry or in missions. And, and just letting God use you to love and to touch the hurt of other people. Now, folks, I challenge you tonight to give, give consideration to these three things. I, I imagine everybody in here has quiet time. But remember, don't leave the book of Psalms out. And we all probably need to rededicate our life when it comes to sharing the gospel. But if you're not involved in missions and ministry, get involved. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Thank you, Brother Chris. Thank you for this sweet church. Uh, for Joe David and Lauren, Eddie and Sue, and everyone that's here tonight. Uh, Lord, uh, you, you have uh, you've spoken to me this week. You've been good. I mean, the music each night has touched my heart and ministered to my need. And I just pray, my prayer is that something we've said this week will be an encouragement to someone here. And um, Lord, I really pray, I really pray that everybody here will have a productive and glorious quiet time in the days to come, that they'll get to share their faith and that they'll get involved in ministry and missions. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.